Hello. I am Todd Black, creator of Guardians Home, Tokyo Blade Detectives, and the upcoming Source Point Press book, Five Bullets, Six Men. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, mainly at, at Guardians underscore comic. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic writer and writer and author as well, too. He has a variety of amazing, talented uh, comics and books to his name itself specifically. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few different comics and of, of his um, stable, we're going to call it. Today, we are joined by Todd Black, creator of Five Bullet Six Men from Source Point Press and Tokyo Blade Detectives and a variety of other things that I'll let him talk about. How are you doing today, Todd? I'm doing great today, Kerr. How are you? When I first saw your, your work, at least for Five Bullet Six Men, I, I thought it was an interesting take on the detective genre. I thought it was a beautifully drawn comic. And from what I briefly got to read, I thought it was really well done as well, too. But because you have so many different real creative pies, so to speak, tell us who you are and, and what you are all about. So yes, I am Todd Black. I am a writer creator of various things. I started out with comics, but I've also done novels. I've done a lot of fan fiction because why not? I endeavor to try and do TV and movies one day. And I just love telling stories. As you noted, I have a lot of fingers and pies because there are so many genres out there that I want to write in and have written. And I've done superheroes, sci-fi fantasy, uh, Disney Pixar style, High Bullet Six Men is a mystery noir. I have Sherlock Holmes mystery novels, and I've got an anime comic that's Tokyo Blade Detectives. I've written wrestling comics, science comics. I do a lot because I love it. So what's the most difficult part about being a creative person when you're writing these stories? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end? Honestly, at times it's just the writing. And I know that sounds weird, but for me, there are times when all I get in my own head, can I write this the way I want to? And so then eventually I just have to plop myself in my chair and just start typing and eventually the words all come out. And then other times it's like, nope, I know exactly what I want to do. And I just write away, uh, write away. Everyone struggles at times. I was actually working on a, a potential future project with an editor recently, and she caught something logic-wise that I just completely missed, that I hadn't even thought about. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I didn't explain that that often. But I, when I was writing it, I didn't catch it. So I'm glad I had that editor to tell me, like, didn't you say this before? <laughs> it's always fun to write, but it is good when I can have people like give me the back and forth. That's why editors are there. When it all comes together, it's a really beautiful thing. And the entities can be the bane of our existence, but they're also very, very, very necessary. I've worked with a set of great editors. I've never called one of them bad. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Although it's, I will say my most recent one said that I'm the perfect writer to work with. And I'm like, yeah, that won't go to my head at all. Uh, when editors start stroking egos of writers, the, I don't know what their alternative motives are. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Like, never give me an inch. Never give me an inch. <laughs> I'm a creative person, damn it. You give me too much credit. It's like, I'm not a creative person. I'm a creative God. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not. Well, let, let's talk about some of your works here. Specifically, we're, we're going to jump into the Source Point Press, uh, soon to be published, I should soon say. Soon to be published. Uh, series Five Bullets, Six Men. For those that don't know anything about that series specifically, tell us what it's all about. Well, I'll make one small correction. It's not a series. It's a, a one-shot graphic novel. Okay. So it's all self-contained. It's it's a story came up with years ago, honestly, about a city full of crime, you know, very noir style. And a detective named Waverly is called in to solve a murder, or more accurately, five murders. The, fi the murder of five of the most dangerous men uh, in this city, they were all shot to death and no one knows who did it, or so they claim. And so it's Waverly's job to figure out what happened, who were these men, why they want, why someone wanted them dead, and then, of course, who is, indeed is the murderer. Sounds like it would be a pretty easy job for a detective to say, yep, yeah, they're all dead, we're good, <laughs> case closed. <laughs> Actually, we make a reference to that. In the book, I won't say how it goes down, but that is something that the detective does bring up. When Source Point Press then first approached you, you know, how did that conversation go, and why did you choose Source Point Press? 
it was actually something years in the making. Um, when I was first starting out uh, with my first two series, Guardians and Home, I was trying to get into, let's just call it as the big leagues. Like I was trying to get into DC and Marvel. At that time in uh, indie comics life, if you will, there were other publishers, but they weren't as well known as that. Like there was literally DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse. And then there was everybody else. Things have obviously changed since then. And when I... I approached Source Point Press at C2E2, the Chicago convention, uh, I think five years ago, something like that. And I had just, I was literally walking the show floor. I was in our Sally at the time, but I was walking the show floor. And I saw a tweet saying like, here are the publishers at C2E2 that you should meet. And one of them was Source Point Press. And, I was, and I, then I literally go for my phone and then I look there's their booth i'm just like oh that's a sign so i go right to them and i talked with one of their heads travis mcintyre great guy we just start talking it's like hey you know i'm a comic writer i'm trying to you know branch out would you be interested in maybe hiring me for something he goes yeah and he goes what kind of stories do you write and i mentioned i had a superhero and a a sci-fi fantasy piece and he goes okay well we don't do superheroes and we do more darker fantasy so here's my card send me some pitches when you get home and we'll go from there. So at this point in time, like right after that, I had no ideas of what I was going to write them. And he goes, and I, but I remembered his thing. I was like, okay, here's the stories we like to come up with. So I literally just went to my mind. I just came up with like five or six ideas of very loose plot that I felt I could, I could write with. And I, I wrote them out and I sent them to him. And he and a now dear friend of mine, Josh Sobek, they got back to me with critiques and ideas and they said, okay, here's the two we like. So write the scripts for them and we'll see where we go from there. And one of them was five bullets, six men. So I literally years ago wrote the uh, script for it and I was, I liked it. I sent it to them. They gave me some edits and uh, then they exploded like, right on the cusp of when they thought that they might be able to get to me, which they had like a, a waiting list order because they had other writers and published deals to do. Um, they started exploding in popularity and I was so happy for them because they are great, great crew there. And so they were like, we will get to you, Todd, just hold on. And then last year, uh, Josh Sobeck reached out to me and goes, Hey Todd, it's time. Let's get this going. So I, I got my, uh, go-to artist, if you will. Uh, his name is Alex Garcia. And we just made the whole book. We sent it to them. They liked it. And it's going to be uh, released in comic stores on April 27th. That's amazing. I, I love seeing and hearing stories like that. Like that. That's yeah. just the best of, uh, of both worlds. It's a, it's a dream come true. This is my first publisher comic. I've, d- I've done self-published and like Kickstarters to get to where I am right now. And so to be recognized and someone to say, hey, Todd, we really like this story. Let's publish it for you, put you in stores. Like, that's a dream come true. Then looking at the the thought process, when you were putting together Five Bullets, Six Men specifically, while, when the idea was germinating in your head there, was there like a, a scene or, or an action or maybe a phrase that kind of triggered that? And how did it turn out when you finally saw it you know, on, the, on the drawn page? I won't say I remember exactly how I came up with the idea, but I do, I have always been a fan of, like mysteries, mm. mystery novels. And uh, I grew up, there was a phase of my life where I grew up on, a, like, I watched like every mystery show on television, whether it was on CBS or Hallmark Channel with McBride and uh, so on and so forth. And th- I had watched certain noir style pieces like the Maltese Falcon, which really mm. shows my age of 33. Some, I can see like, what's the Maltese Falcon? Like, <laughs> look it up. It's a great movie. But like, I remember that style of like old school and the narration and, I just wanted to build off of that. But then I was like, you know, I got to have a, a meaningful story. So I was like, and then I remembered Sin City, the all time, an all the all time classic Frank Miller story. That was a good movie. And I was like, okay, what if I took like, you know, that kind of a style, but with my own kind of story and put some fun twists into it. And as I started writing it, it was just like, I could just hear the narration of my character Waverly. And I decided to take like a little bit of a different track in terms of how to solve the mystery. And it's a really fun insight into the characters, the world, and then who the, who the murderer is. Um, it's really fun. And it was just, and then when Alex started drawing it, I'm like, okay, Alex, we're going to do like Sin City, uh, you know, pure black and white. And we honestly hadn't done that kind of story before. All of our books that we had worked on together were all color. 
And so I was very curious to see how he could make like the black and whites and grays pop. And uh, he got it really well. And I was, and then when at times he maybe went a little too solid, like, no, no, add the details there. It's like enriched. And he goes, okay. And so he just made it pop even more. And it's, there's some really cool pages that uh, people are going to get to see when the, the book comes out. I was really surprised. The, the cover kind of blew me away because I loved how that cover turned out. That was just really an, an incredible, like, that was just an eye-catching piece just right off the bat. It was one of those, like, wow. Yeah, that was, I was very proud of that. Um, I, I, def- I had that idea. I was like, what if we showed Waverly, that's him on the cover, and then the bullets, actual bullets with the silhouette. It was originally silhouettes, but they're like, now nah, let's, once we had all the characters drawn, I was like, now let's put them on the bullets to show that these are the ones who are marked for death. Alex killed it. And then actually we had that in black and white before. Mm. And then a uh, source point came to me and was like, hey, we want to add a, a little bit of like extra color texture to a DMI. It's like, no, nah, go ahead. And that's how it turned out color wise the way it did. But it's it's still really, really cool, no matter how you look at it. Now, I always find the nameology of character creation fascinating because it's a kind of a glimpse into the mindset of the creators and the writers themselves, too. How did you come up with the name of, or the names, I should say, of in Five Bullets, Six Men? I think it was, I won't say, I remember exactly because Mm -hmm. it was been so long, but I knew that I wanted the name to feel kind of special in a noir kind of way, like the Maltese Falcon, uh, like that name, when you just say Maltese Falcon, like without the, the context, it doesn't mean anything. But when, when you watch the movie, it's everything. Everything is around this, this Maltese Falcon and, uh, or Sin City. You know, it's not just about the characters. The whole city is a, is a place that is a character. And with this one, I, I just thought that kind of just had that that same texture, if you will. Mm-hmm. There, there were we're, you're going to find out that the five men who died were at a table seated for six. Mm-hmm. So that there were six men at the table. Five bullets were shot, and thus one man walked away. But why and how did it all happen? You know, that's the mystery. And so, and then just like the even just the, having the numbers, like there were five bullets, but there were six men there. So clearly, one of them walked away. Uh, I, that just kind of felt kind of impactful and cool. I love concepts. I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're thinking through story and a theme and a batch of characters. I know a common thing that I've had with creative people, whether they're writers or artists or whatever, a combination of both on the show in the in the past has been, my characters speak to me and I speak back. Uh, has that happened with you? Oh, definitely. There are characters that I've absolutely connected with. There's a character I'm writing for a potential secret project right now that I, I really connect with. And then uh, in my book, Home, I, I have this main character named Alicia, and I literally define her as the most relatable character ever. It's just she has blue hair. Like, that resonates with people because, like, yeah, I would be friends with Alicia, but then she's born with natural blue hair. That throws people off. And so, you know, she gets bullied because of that. And I was bullied as a kid and as a teen and as an adult. So... You know, I can connect, can connect with that and like voice her pain because it was my pain once upon a time. Waverly, I'll admit, I don't have as much of a connection to because he is a detective. Uh, I'm a writer and he he definitely has certain views on life and crime. And he says like uh, he dedicates himself like almost wholeheartedly to his work. He has a line in the comic he keeps repeating called a lot, a lot of long nights because, you know, why well, have a life in this city when, you know, you're supposed to be protecting other lives so he he was a little harder to connect to but because i knew how to write detectives before like with sherlock holmes and other ones um it was easy enough to get his voice across and to showcase his both his personality and his detective skills now as a writer then what was the first thing that you wrote that made you realize yes i could do this as a career there are two things i would say Mm -hmm. the first was my mental writings because when i grew up as a kid I watched a lot of television. <laughs> I still watch a lot of television for the record. But um, what I would do is I would put myself in my favorite shows and I would unintentionally at, at first just make my own stories. Power Rangers, and Pokemon, and Digimon, and uh, all these other ones that I loved. I would put myself in in their shoes or my, or my own shoes in their world and come up with these stories. And that kind of fed the spark over the years. And I did that for so long then when i was in high school i think it was i wrote what would become 
my superhero series Guardians. It was originally meant to be a four part movie series because naturally I was going to make movies like right out of college naturally. But I wrote out like the characters who I wanted them to be, their villains, et cetera, et cetera. It, it just kind of grew into that. Then when I went to college, uh, I went into digital media and video game development. And while I was at first like enamored with like 3D modeling and game design, I still am to an extent. It was the writing that I was just like, this is what I love. This is what I'm good at. I would love to be a video game writer. And so I focused as many times, much classes as I could to the writing and every writing class I got in A. I'm not bragging. Yes, I am. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was really good at those writing classes. And I was like that when I get good, when I get good grades, you know, that's, that's, that's a sign. I was good at history and I was good at writing. Uh, it was just like that snowball effect. And then when I really became a comic writer was when I wrote my first fan fiction which was uh, based in the Avatar cartoon universe, uh, Last Airbender Legend of Korra. I wrote one about the Avatar to come after Korra, and I called it Spirit of Earth. And it started out as just, I wanted to get the idea out of my head. Then people were like, dude, this is awesome. You should write more. So I wrote the entire series, 80 chapters. And that was my first long form series ever. By the time I was done, I was like, yeah, I can write stories like this. So let's do other things. So I started writing teleplays and I wrote comics. Uh, and then the blog that actually held my fan fiction got deleted. So I lost the last book of Spirit of Earth. So uh, it hurts, but it was popular at the time. So I can appreciate that. But it was just one thing after another, starting with my mental writings then like my dream writings and the fan fiction, then once I had the confidence, that became the comic writing, the novel writing, and everything else in between. So how has all this writing shaped you as a creative person? On one hand, it's made me appreciative of really good stories. Like when I when I see something like in a movie or a TV series that is just beautiful or perfect, I will gush about it for days. Uh, a great example is, have you ever heard watched the series The Good Place? Yeah. Oh, see. So so you understand, oh, like yeah. that show was beautiful. I mean, their take on philosophy and the mm. characters, they never, they were rarely ever stagnant, which is something you never really say for a sitcom these days or any show these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it was beautiful from like start to finish and like the passion that was, went into making those worlds and those characters was evident. And I love The Good Place. Um, but then when I look at, and I, this actually kind of hurts me, I look at certain Marvel and DC superhero shows and movies. I see things and I'm like, that's bad writing. Like, well, that's a bad plot point. And I would never do that before. There were times when I would be just like, you know, like, ooh, this is so good. And then today it's just like, okay, but why did that character think that? You know, like, why would this super smart character suddenly do that and it was just it, like it gets bad and i'm like am i just a bad person am i am i am i becoming such a cynic that i can't appreciate anything anymore but it's, it's more than just that as a writer i look for these things now i look for these plot points and these character developments and then i'll take those things and i'll be like okay that was bad don't do that in your books todd so <laughs> see something like the good place i'll be like aspire to do something that grand and while I can't say I will ever be as you know good as the good place, it's something that I can strive toward. And I and I never I never really thought about it like that until I watched it. Or or I what I would love to do like an animated series one day. And what's my top of animated series? Well, you could have Avatar, or you could have Ducktales, because <laughs> Ducktales, woohoo! That yeah. show. The, it's pretty clear I'm talking about the reboot, not the original 90s series, but that was good too. But the, the reboot on Disney, Disney XD was so grand. And then they ended it. Why? Why did you end DuckTales? But like, that's the passion I had for that and the love that I had for that show because it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Like, I would love to be tied to a series like that where it's just fun and great writing and great characters all day long in your opinion as as a writer for for comics and, and other in prose and everything like that what is the most important quality of a writer in today's comics and how does that translate to your own work this is actually something i'll be talking about at a comic con coming up my first ever panel to me the most important thing is to believe in your story whether that be a comic or a novel or a fan fiction or whatever you want you have to believe in it and here's why I say that. 
anyone can write. I truly believe that. Whether you actually get the writing done, whether you actually get your stuff published, that's on you. I had all these ideas. I had, you know, a story for Pokemon, a story for Power Rangers. I still do. And, you know, I have the, had the Avatar fan fiction and whatever. But for the longest time, they were just in here. You know, they were just thoughts in my head. And that was fine in context because, you know, that's how they're supposed to start. But I never thought I could write them. And then when I started doing um, Guardians, my superhero series, my first ever comic series, I thought I knew everything. I thought, as all, you know, young aspiring people do, you know, I thought I knew everything. I, I thought I knew how this was all going to go. And it, I fell on my face within three issues. It was, it was bad. I almost went broke making comics. And I was low i was so dang low i was like was this stupid did i just waste all this money did i was i wrong to think that i could do comics and i got to the point where i was like no i wasn't wrong i just got to do it a little bit smarter and so i worked with alex who was the artist on guardians for most for pretty much the whole series and i worked out a deal with them where it would not bankrupt me to make comics but we could still make comics and so i did that and then when i got this inspiration for home i realized i wanted to do it but i didn't want to do it the same way so i went to kickstarter and i had to believe that i could make this work on kickstarter even though i had three failed projects before then and i got that done and then i did a graphic novel and that was a challenge and i got that done and i just i kept believing in the comic and then right now i have a anime comic called tokyo blade detectives that's the kickstarter link below for you watching um and that was a very different kind of comic because it was anime it was a little more violent and uh, a lot a lot of lore in it and i'm like will people like this so i put it on a kickstarter and i had to believe it and i put the effort into it to make the art good to make it sound cool to make it feel like something that people would pledge to and they did the whole first arc got funded now we're on issue number five and same thing with uh, my Sherlock Holmes books. And then I reached out to a wrestler to ask them to tell their story. And they said yes. And now I'm being published by Source Point Press. Every step of the way, I had to believe that my stories were worth telling. I had to believe that I could put them out into the world. And if I failed, I would just have to believe harder and make it work one way or the other. And there are some out there, and I've met a few, who are like, I don't know if I can do this. And it's only impossible if you don't try. Like, that's the truth. If you don't, if you believe in yourself and your stories, you will get this done. If you believe in your artistic abilities, as long as you keep practicing and refining and growing, you'll get it done. Alex has done superhero art. He's done anime art. He's done uh, Disney Pixar style art. He's done black and white noir. He's done all these different stories styles that before he never even had in his portfolio but he believed he got it done and now i can't really imagine doing comics without him because he's that good and i always try and get him work and as for me i am confident in doing all these different genres and i've got some i've got more that i want to do and i'm going to believe that i can get these done and make them meaningful stories because that's what i know i need to do to get them out of my head and into print or onto the internet where for people can read got to believe believing is good and, and i agree with you 100 percent. it was i i feel the passion for your free words i i see your believability in creating your work i'm, I'm going to use believability because i believability think, yes I, I couldn't think of a word to fill in that that gap there okay. but but it takes hard work though as well too it takes can, it takes people it takes connections it, it takes is. it takes time it's and, and it's true, but if you really boil it down, your hard work is built off of your belief. If you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to do the work because you're like, but it, it won't work. It won't look good. You, you know, why try if, it's, if I'm going to fail? If you don't believe, the work never comes. If I don't believe, okay, I'll give you an example. I, I was inspired recently by a video game to write a novel based on certain things. I had the doubt in my head. I'm like, but you're working on these other projects. You still have that other novel project you never wrote, you never did. You know, do you really want to do this now? And then the more I thought about it, I realized if I 
don't at least try, then the idea is just going to be rummaging in my head. And so I started writing page after page after page. And I'm like, oh, this is really good. Ooh, what if I do this? And page after page. Now I'm like three chapters in. And the only reason I don't have more is because I've been swamped with work this whole week. So I haven't had time to write. But it was that belief that pushed me. And yes, it is absolutely hard work. Make no mistake. There is a lot of hard work between the writer, the artist, the editor, the letter. Uh, if you do Kickstarter and the promotion is is draining, but you you have to believe in it to get that push, at least to me. You have to believe to get that push because without it, without that drive, without that um, determination to want to get this done, you're not going to put in the work. And then, it, then you'll be like, oh, but I failed. It's like, yeah, because you didn't believe. You didn't believe in yourself. You didn't believe in your story. You didn't believe in the art. You didn't believe in your team. And so you didn't push hard enough. If you push and sometimes you'll fail. I failed. I failed royally at first, but I, I found the way. I found the right people. I made the connections. That was hard, but and I'm still making connections now, um, including with you, Kurt. Uh, you learn, but through the process, you keep the belief going because you want your story, you want your art, you want your idea to be out there. And if you believe and you maintain that belief, everything else can follow. I have to. I had to push that question because I appreciate it. it goes, and I'll and I'll remember that for my panel because I'm sure it'd be like. But is belief enough? Well, it's the start. You got to start somewhere. Because it's it's difficult. You're you're right. Self doubt, imposter syndrome, everything else along that line. When it comes to any creative person or project, for that matter, it, it is always going to be there. You know, yeah. If we're not doing what we're we're passionate about, what we're we're doing as creative people then just work a nine to five job and then you know let your creativity die on the vine and i almost had that happen that's actually why i went to comics was because i was dying almost literally in a nine to five job and i was like i can't i have to have something to keep me going because this is killing me on the inside and i can't imagine going back to a nine to five job i work from home i, I do a freelance work for various things and that allows me to do my comic passion but uh and every story is different. Like you mentioned imposter syndrome. I have that a lot. <laughs> I mean, I have over 45 books published in my name and I'm about to have a publisher book and I still have imposter syndrome because um, I'm like, why is this happening? Why is, why, why is this person getting this and not me? Like, am I not doing enough work? Uh, I just, I saw a guy and I think he started comics after me and uh, we're, we're friends on Facebook and he makes comics too. And he said, you know, I quit my job. I took out everything on my 401k and I made a comic company and it's now valued at over a million dollars. And I'm like, wow, why didn't that happen to me again? <laughs> and then I had to pause and I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute, Todd. Uh, you don't know what his life was like beforehand. He talked about draining his 401k, which you did not have, Todd. Uh, you don't know the steps he took to make sure that he got his company to be worth a million dollars and so on and so forth. Uh, every one of our paths is different. No one in the comic industry, to my knowledge, has the exact same path to success. And that's, and, and even after success, how they maintain it. Um, that's part of the, the I want to say the mystique, if you will, because you don't know what's going to happen next. I started out with, with the superhero comics because that's what I knew. I knew superheroes better than anything. And so I wrote that and I wrote that for 20 issues. And then I did a sci-fi fantasy. Then I did Disney Pixar and Sherlock Holmes and, anime and wrestling and science comics and uh if you had told me when i was starting out with guardians that i would have you know all these genres under my book with more stories in my head including ones that i never thought i would ever write i would say like but i'm i'm a superhero guy you know like that's my thing i wanted to i had like my, with my guardian series i honestly had a, a stories for like a hundred issues in my head i've only gone through one fifth of that and but that's that's fine because i'll i can come back to guardians eventually but having this this girth this wealth of genres and stories it makes me a better writer because i'm in my opinion because i'm not sticking to one thing and only that one thing i am appealing to so many people and i've met so many people and i've gotten support from so many people because of how i have all these stories and that's my story and that's my story now like i started out rigid in one thing and now i have this variety and i can't imagine my comic life or my writing life without all these characters in my head i my banner 
at Comic Cons is a picture of me surrounded by all the character, most of the characters that I've made so far. And it's just awesome because I'm like, I made you, I made you, I made you. So it's just a beautiful thing. And that helps me with my imposter syndrome because I, I sometimes hear these success stories or these random people getting like big jobs at these big companies. And I'm like, I know I've done more than them. And yet I'm not even getting a look. I'm like, you don't know, Todd. You don't know what steps led to that. And your steps will come eventually, like right now with Five Bullet Six Men. Like that took a while, but it's happening and it might lead to new things. I don't know what they might be, but I will be hopeful and you know push on either way. So it, everyone has a different journey in this this comic or writer or artist life. And it the beauty of it is seeing as seeing where it goes and how you change and how you grow and how you evolve through it. So, and I, I'm glad that this is my life in part or in full, however I want to look at it. When you look back, like you, like you said, you, your banner showcases what you've created. You're, you're looking back on, on your accomplishments so far and you have many more to come in the future. And the fact that you're able to continue to do what you, what you love and what you're passionate about and get paid for it as well too. Let's, let's not split hairs is paid. <laughs> <Paid>? <laughs> that that's a thing i hear right, with some uh, kind of people uh, i mean i pay my artist there you go <laughs> does that count <laughs> that counts <laughs> you're paying you're paying the people that you, that you need to around you for sure I do. you're you're a creative person that's putting out great work for the masses to consume and they're consuming it at an alarmingly fa fast rate even to this day <laughs> i mean seven million people or billion people i should say plus in the in the world and you're providing entertainment to too many of them. So that's great to hear. Yeah. Now, I was going to say, like, one of, I have a friend named Candace, and we became friends because we were at a con together, and she she's an artist. And she came over and she bought my book home, which at the time was complete, I believe. And she came to me, like, a, the next day, it was a two-day con. She read it the previous day, and she goes, you know, I love this book because I totally resonated with Alicia. And, like, th it, this book, is kind of like a reflection of my life in some ways. And I'm just like, wow, like that was, that was really special to me. And we, we've been friends ever since, but I wouldn't have made that friend if I hadn't made that book and she hadn't connected with my character. And like, that is something I'm going to treasure. And I've had other people meet me because of my books and want to work with me because of my books and support my Kickstarters and everything. And it's, it's, these are the things they don't tell you about when you're making this stuff because your focus is oh, okay we got to get the books out but then there's you know there's the selling there's the interacting there's the meeting people at Euchre where i get to talk about my comics on these shows and you know the, these connections are moments that they don't tell you about but they are the best to experience you mentioned that you've had you have a lot up here and you have a lot run down how many half finished scripts do you have plenty <laughs> When, for example, Tokyo Blade Detectives, that's the one I have Kickstarter on right now. I had that idea three years ago, give or take, but I didn't start making it until late 2020. Uh, hmm. No, sorry, late 20... Was it 19? Either way. Um, I... I I had the idea and I wrote it all down and I, I wrote out the lore. I wrote out, you know, the first arc basically, but I had to put it away because I had other projects that I was needing to do and I wasn't in the best place financially. And then as things started to grow, I was like, okay, let's start getting Tokyo out. And so, and that for about a year or so, I, I got the first four on Kickstarter. Um, I have a novel that I started in college that I still want to finish, but I, haven't uh i have an alien comic i want to do i have a space co cowboy comic i want to do i have a romance graphic novel i'm like what like, why do i have a romance idea i don't know but it's there <laughs> so um i, I trust you, i usually hate romance stories but this one kind of sounded kind of fun i'm like okay why not what's wrong with it it's one of the few genres i haven't done and uh I told you about the source point press. Those all the, all those pitches I gave. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them, one of them I actually wrote uh, like a script for, and uh, that was actually a prison comic, for lack of a better term. Nice. And that that was that was one I want to I do want to do. And there's a uh, 
how do I want to call this? I guess Space Marine, I suppose, uh, story that Source Point almost picked up that I would love to do. And I've also got like, kind of like a Lost in Space kind of story that I want to do. And like, and they just keep coming. And then I told you about the, the novel inspired by the video game. Like, that's what I want to do. It's just like, oh, it's too much. <laughs> and then I'll be like, oh, I have this idea. No, bad, bad, Todd, bad. <laughs> you have other ideas to finish. <laughs> Yeah. So, mm. but that, but I like that because a fear that I honestly had at one point in time was running out of ideas. Like, what is a writer who runs out of ideas, and especially one who doesn't have access to, uh, like the DC Marvel verse of characters? Because I could write those stories for ages. I know I could, but for my own ideas, the ones that I want to build my reputation on, um, what happens if I run out of ideas, and then being the guy that i am honestly i just get inspired by things like the video game i mentioned earlier my system's over there and uh like that happened and it was just a really good story i was just like "Ooh, but what if they had done this and this and like oh there's your idea make that and I'm like okay and then all these other comic ideas is just like "Ooh, what if i did that what if they did this Ooh, what if i had done this like that would be such a cool idea um I told you about the space cowboy story. I taught uh, that came because of a friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Palmiotti mm -hmm. from DC yeah. Comics and uh, Paper Films. Uh, he he noted that he had a space cowboy. He had never done a space cowboy story, but he wanted to. And I'm like, oh, I love space cowboy stories. Like uh, Outlaw Star anime is my favorite ever. And I'm like, and then I paused and I'm like, what would be my Space Cowboy story, and now 10 minutes later, I had the idea, and I'm like, crap, this is really good, but I can't make it right now. So it just it just happens. And uh, But yeah, I have a lot of ideas on this USB that I've had for years, and uh, I when I have a really fleshed out one, I'll write out the outline so I don't forget it, like what I've done with my Space Cowboy story, my romance not graphic novel. And uh, I leave them there, and then when the time comes... <laughs> I will go back to them and I will write out the script and take it from there. What was the first comic or story that made you cry? I try to think about that. Comic wise. I don't know if I've ever cried during one. I've been shocked during them. I've been angry during them, you know, like bad, bad writing or stuff or character death that I didn't like. I, ooh, I, I really don't know. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. Okay, I don't know if this is the first, but it's one that is memorable, and I'm I, I'm curious if you had the same experience. There was this movie called Up. <laughs> 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 yep, the first what was it? Ten minutes mm -hmm. of Up with uh his story that hurt. Yeah, <laughs> that hurt. It's just like you know, because at this point in time, I had watched like every pixar movie the toy stories monsters inc all of them you go into up and you see the commercials and you know the, the balloon house and everything it, it, it's it's like oh this is gonna be a whimsical adventure and then they just like that hurt so bad i felt bad i remember that because then i remember reading a review of up afterward and some jerk gave it a one star because of that opening i was just like that's the point. You're supposed to feel bad. It sets up the character. And like, that was so bold. That was definitely one that I specifically remember. And I've cried at many films after that. I, I do, including in my adult years, but up was, whoa. <laughs> Look, Disney and Pixar knows how to tug at heartstrings and stab them as well, too. I mean, they're, yeah. they're literally... There have been, and the animation alone is is beautiful, but but the storytelling yeah. itself is truly something that is is incredible. To Toy Story three, oh. the infer the Inferno scene, oh, yeah, 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 and then the the last play date with Andy, mm -hmm. with him and the girl, and he goes, "Thanks for everything, guys." I am crying my eyes yeah. out. I'm a college kid, and I am bawling. And then I go home and I tell my parents, and I'm just like, "Oh my gosh, they had this scene where Woody and and." and I just break down and just like, oh, got me again. What is your creative kryptonite? For the longest time, it was love stories. And when I say love stories, I mean like 
characters falling in love with one another and uh, fleshing it out because between the various cartoons and live action and movies and stuff like that, I had seen so many crappy romance stories, you know, don't get me started on the Hallmark channel. Oh. <laughs> My mom's favorite channel, though she'll deny it. Um, I hated writing those stories. When I wrote my Avatar fanfic, I had this love triangle that I intentionally delayed for books. Like I was just like, yeah, the, I, you could tell they like each other, but I'm not going to address that. And then I had I had to force myself to write the conclusion to say who would he go with and blah blah blah. And it made sense to me. But most of my stories don't have romance because. I don't like writing because I, it, I either feel come off as cheesy or lame and I've, I have to work really hard, which is again, ironic that I have this romance graphic novel idea, but I feel I could pull it off in a way that was fun and meaningful and yet true. But for the longest time, and even to this day, I still have those fears because I still see the TV shows and movies that are just so bad with the romance. <laughs> it's like, we don't, people, I mean, I'm sure some people act that way, but like most of us, do not act that way. Like, stop it. Get some help. When was the first time that you learned that language had power? Ooh, I like that. That's a good one. I don't know when I learned it, but looking back at my life, I was influenced by language in a variety of ways because I watched so much TV shows, which is its own language. But read certain books, which is obviously a language. These shows, these books, these movies, these comics, they inspired me. They resonated with me. I would not be a TV movie comic nerd if these books didn't resonate. Well, I can't say when I first realized it, looking back, it was obvious that I learned that the, this is good. Like, this is fun. This is special. And I eventually would become a part of that. But uh, when you when you connect with something, you want more of it. And I'm very much a TV addict. And if mm -hmm. I find a good show, I will want to watch it to the end. I've had that honor multiple times. Yeah, it, definitely a very young age. Before I do that, uh, is there anything I haven't touched on that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? I know we'll, we'll talk about social media, where we can find you, how we can support you at the end. But is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I've already talked about believing in your comics. That's something I, I truly want to make known have fun like have fun with your stories or your comics or your art or whatnot i've had the pleasure of working with many people on these books i wouldn't be still doing it if i didn't have fun with them i love writing these stories and thinking about what's coming next and what i can do next and it, it excites me if you want to go into this industry don't go into it thinking you're going to be rich or you're going to be famous or whatever. I'm definitely not rich. That's for sure. Uh, I'm only slightly kind of sort of not really, I'm not famous. I'm having the time of my life. I can say that I've made these books and that I'm making these stories and that these are my ideas and who knows what they'll come, where, where they'll go later. But there is a fun to this that is hard to describe unless you've been there. And so if you are trying to follow this path, whether it be novels or comics or another medium entirely, go into it wanting to have the time of your life but push yourself so that once it's done you're like oh my gosh this was so worth it everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you i, I do i would say i've had many people inspire me uh, you know they're like there are certain DC Comics and Marvel writers and artists that I've met. I have a comic mentor who very much inspired me because he's doing his own thing and he's having the time of his life. I'll say that this is this is actually a hard question. Uh, it's really hard, Kurt, because um, I, I have so many people I would love. To, I would like to thank the Academy. And, whoosh, so, okay, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, Gail Simone. Mm -hmm. Gail Simone is the most is one of the funniest people you ever meet. One of the most creative people you ever meet. The, one of the most passionate people you ever meet. I met her once at a Comic-Con, C2E2, I believe. And then I met her a year later and I was going to give her a comic and her husband, I had met both times. And he, I come up to him a year later, hadn't seen him since. And he goes, oh, you're the Guardians guy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you remember me? And he goes, how, how would I not remember you? And it's just like, that blew my mind that her, and she remembered me too, but like they would remember me just this, random indie guy and then the passion she puts into her comics whether they, they've been batgirl secret six uh, birds of prey deadpool domino all of them 
she just has this love and this passion and she calls people out when it's right. Um, she has the time of her life on Twitter. Uh, she may or may not be a bear. I'm just saying. And uh, Twitter follows. I get that joke. Mm-hmm. But uh, she is just so much fun. And I can't wait to meet her again because she's always a blast. And if you don't follow Gail Simone, if you don't read her books, please do. She is absolutely one of the best. And she also has a, a, a interesting way to make tea as well as. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she uses Cyclops' heat vision. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, you know, he's never been good for anything else. Yeah. Total fake, total fakey, right? Yeah, exactly. He's not, yeah. he's not a true, not a yeah. true at all. From a professional perspective, you have created 45 plus books. You are creating so many more that you can't talk about, I'm sure. And you are creating more in the future as well, too. Professionally, you have, you're now being published as well in uh, in the upcoming weeks with Source Point Press. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes, but only in the sense that I'm doing what I love because a few years back when I was, I would still call this more of a hobby. I was just making it by making comics where I could. And I wasn't, I was barely doing cons. I was maybe doing like one or two a year. And it, it was more of just, you know, I'm doing this. So I have something to look forward to versus now where it's like, I want to keep making comics because I want to do more. I want to go to more cons. I'm going to be doing two in April, one in June, uh, one in August, one in November. I think I did 10 cons in one year and it was awesome. I was just like, okay, what's the next con? Let's go there now. Um, and again, got 45 books. That's I've, I've made professionals jaws drop when I said that I'm an indie guy and I've, I've gotten 45 or you know 30 40 however many at the time done it like wait really <laughs> so i've impressed them just by the fact that i got this all done and that's not including all the like the fan fiction and all those that all that hard work that i would consider published works so i would consider myself successful do i am i where i want to be no that i would call that professional success but i am absolutely successful and i've got my comics made i have As of now, 11 straight successful Kickstarters, which is a feat in and of itself. And I have people who are excited for my books, and that's a success all on its own. The reverse of success is a failure. How do you deal with your failures? Vodka. Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, (laughs) I don't don't drink. Uh, Failure comes in multiple forms. Like I, I noted earlier that I had three straight unsuccessful kickstarters and that hurt like one of them was a stupid thing i should never have done it but two of them i really put my hard work into and i'm like why isn't this working why didn't i get funded then i hit this hot streak but even then i could see that at times i wasn't getting the returns i wanted and part of that was because of the book i'm sure but i have to when it comes to failure or potential failure even i have to gauge myself saying like even if you fail in this you can bounce back. Like I know, have no doubt that eventually one of my Kickstarters will fail again. And then I'll just have to regroup and bounce back to where either I put more of myself into it to where I know I can get the Kickstarter goal or I do, or I do more promotion or I find another way. And I failed in other things. Like I am horrible social media. <laughs> like, like that's supposed to be like the thing that a guy like me is supposed to be great at, but I, I suck at it. And um, I'm joining now new communities, trying to, you know, expand my reach, get people to check me out more. I'm doing, trying to do more comic cons. I, you know, try and extend my reach. It's very much about not beating yourself up and I still do it. I'm, hor- I'm absolutely legendary at self-deprecation, but, uh, when it comes right down to it, if you only focus on the failure, you're never going to get anywhere. And I've been... I have failed a lot in my life in certain things and I don't want that to be with comics. So, you know, just being accepting of it and looking to what you can do next is the best way to go. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a a writer, comic writer, or whatever they would like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Be true to the stories that they want to tell like this this ties into believe into your believing your comics and such but uh tell the stories you want to tell tell the stories that you think are meaningful even if 
other people don't get it. Like I had two very established writers tell me really early on, don't make superhero comics because everyone's doing that. But yeah, Guardians is one of the best sellers at cons, like almost every time, because people like superhero stories and they want to read them. Um, and then pay it forward. If someone comes up to you and says like, how did you get started? Tell them. If they ask for advice, give it to them. I had a mentor, his name is Brian K. Morris, and he gave me so much advice early on. Um, we met at a con and we've been friends ever since. And I go to him when I was like, hey, Brian, what should I do about this? Well, Todd, you should do this, this, and this. He was actually an editor on one of my comics for a time. And I trust him. And now when I help to help the next generation, which I am trying to do with my, my Kickstarters and everything, um, I want to be that guy. I want to pay it forward and but also tell the stories that would inspire them so that like one of my stories might be their good place or ducktails or something like that it's like this is so awesome i want to make my own story kind of like that so there are many ways to do it but as long as you're willing to do it that's what's important i hate to say this though but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you survived so thank you so much for coming on the show i greatly appreciate it before i let you go though where can we find you? How can we support you on the internet and uh, everything along that line? Well, I'm on Twitter at guardians underscore comic. That's my, also my uh, Instagram handle uh, on Twitter. You'll also find a link to my Amazon page where I have most of my books, not all of them, but most of my books on Amazon available in Kindle or paperback. Should you like prefer that the way you can support me is buy my books. I know that sounds crass, but for some of us, that is just the way it is. And if you buy my book on Amazon, please review it if you like it. Or if you don't like it, don't review it. As you can see in the link below, I have a Kickstarter. It's live right now. It's for my anime comic, Tokyo Blade Detectives. This is our fifth issue, but we have rewards to get you number one through four if you want. And we have already hit our funding goal, but we are looking to get 100 backers plus. And that would be awesome if you check that out. And in fact, you could actually get my books via the Kickstarter because we have certain rewards to let you get all of them. There you go. And that would be very helpful and supportive to me. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website at tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person as well, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.